Hello, this is Dr. Smajewski, and I want to welcome you to Environmental Science 1401 um, and welcome you to our first lecture, which is going to cover chapters one and two of your textbook. Um, this chapter will go into a little about um, what is environmental science, what is the environment, what's the science behind environmental science, and, touch, and also touches upon the idea of sustainability and ethics and how we make decisions in environmental science. Do also read your textbook for this information and the PowerPoints that accompany the book, which are present on D2L. Um, so when we look at the outline of what we'll cover today, again, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at uh, various chop topics that give us this whole picture of the scope of environmental science and the science of it and also the other disciplines that help environmental science. Now, a very important thing we're going to learn in this class is that environmental science is done for people and we also do things for the environment obviously but a lot of it that we do for the environment is we look at how to use resources and how to protect the environment mostly for our own good now of course there are some environmental scientists that help nature for the sake of nature but most of us practice this in a way that we're helping humans and this can include things like uh when we talk about humans help us to be better consumers. We also could look at things like public health, like in the slide here. And what's really important is our daily decision making affects how we use the environment and in effect also affects what we call global health. And global health can mean the health of the planet and how it affects our own health. So we're going to be looking at concepts throughout the semester about how our daily decisions and your decisions affect global health and how these are affected by you know, uh, social factors and personal ethics systems. Um, and this can include things like cho just choice of clothing, choice of a car, choice of your lifestyle. Um, and we're gonna look at some people that are leaders in looking at these decisions like Linda Greer, who looks at uh, a, a factor called clean by design and looks at how do we design products and industries to reduce pollution and improve not just the earth in general, but um, the environment that impacts us. So besides being a professor, I am also an active environmental scientist that works in consulting and environmental policy. And a lot of my work is actually not doing science. A lot of it is using science from other studies to help people make uh, informed decisions about how they use their resources and how our decisions affect other people. So for example, when we look at uh, consumer influence of choices on clothing designers uh, and the leather industry in general. Um, I have a project that I'm working on in Bangladesh, which has been now, f we're working for five years on it, of trying to clean up water pollution, which just just like that, what you see there in the picture, uh, that come from these uh, tanneries that basically prepare tan leathers from particularly cattle to use in clothing and, and you just name it, many objects today uh, that we use every day use leather. Well, the pollution that's produced from the leather industries is poisoning the people of Bangladesh. And we're trying to find ways to reduce the population from being poisoned without ruining that leather industry, which is responsible for the income of a lot of people and is important income for that country and India and even China and parts of Africa. And we look at certain responsible companies uh, or companies that try to be responsible like Nike and others and a lot of the computer industries and auto industries that are really looking at reducing material use and reducing pollution and helping to make consumers have informed decisions that don't harm people, either in our own countries by damaging the environment or by in other countries where these products are made. Unfortunately, like any science, environmental science is going to be filled with terms, but luckily we're going to be applying these terms throughout the semester uh, and also, you know, use them in various disciplines. So when we look at what an environment is, environment is a, what we call a collection of systems, which are either living or non-living. And later we'll call these living things biotic and these non-living things abiotic. And the environment can extend beyond the earth to our sun and even our whole solar system and beyond our galaxy and the whole universe in general because even what goes on in our galaxy significantly affects the earth in ways we've never realized before. Now when we use the term system, uh, a system is basically um, a, a bunch of things in the environment that interact and it could be 
a few components, several components, and we're going to look at this more in detail. Um, what environmental scientists usually study are things that we call ecosystems. That means a, a, a system of organisms and of what we call the earth and how they all interact, produce this unique environment we call an ecosystem. One example of an ecosystem is a coral reef like you see in my background. And part of my work too, uh, that I do as a volunteer scientist is I serve on a board of directors for the preservation of a coral reef, literally about 120 miles south of uh, the Texas, Louisiana coast. And it's really been fun because I get to go out there on a boat I don't scuba dive anymore, so don't go into the reef, but I work on a boat uh, studying the reef, and I'll show you later on in the semester some videos of how we do this. As an environmental scientist, when I think of ecosystems, I think of something as a resource that humans and other organisms use, and we have to figure out a way of doing this in an appropriate manner. And unfortunately, we are governed a lot by our own cultures and beliefs on how we interpret what is appropriate ways to use the environment. And we're going to learn a, a term called environmental footprint, which means for every organism and every human or whatever, we can look at how much we use the environment and what type of damage, if any, do we do to the environment while we're using resources. So uh, when we look again as environmental scientists, we have to look at humans as being stewards of the world. And we can be good stewards or bad stewards. So we use this term ecosystem services as a way of us trying to understand what do environments provide for us. And we don't just mean economically. We mean it could be as far as aesthetics, which means beauty. It could be that's a safe place for us. It could be just a place to escape like a wilderness. It could be a place where we mine, and that's something we have to remember, because when we look at our own national parks, those were actually put aside as an ecosystem service to find lumber and mineral resources to keep our country going and to keep it independent of other countries, which we're not right now. Um, we also have to pay attention to an ecosystem service called environmental cycling. That means each ecosystem on the earth shares resources with other ecosystems through water, through atmosphere, through soil, and through, um, you know, cycles that are affected by the, our own solar system. So we're going to look at how things travel from ecosystem to ecosystem and why it's important to understand the impacts of what we do on one ecosystem and how that affects other ecosystems. Now, another term we have to be aware of and also cautious of is this term uh, sustainability. Because what sustainability is, it's, it's, it, it has a definition, but it's, very, it's relative to people's perceptions, which is why we uncover ethics a little later. So when we talk about sustainability, it's looking at how people use the earth in a way that we basically give back and use the earth in a way that future generations can have almost equal access to it. We also have to pay attention to, to the way we use the earth and how it affects other organisms. So sustainability is um, a concept that goes back a long way and is evident in many uh, older cultures such as Native Americans, uh, Native Africans, Native South Americans, Native Asian populations where they lived somewhat in harmony with the with their environment. And if they did damage the environment, they moved on to let the environment heal. Most modern cultures, based on European philosophies, what we call colonialist philosophies, don't believe it in that type of principle. We believe in looking at the earth as basically just something we take from and not always give back and sometimes take from areas beyond our own and also overuse resources sometimes. And in a case, sometimes we don't put those resources back in a form where they can enter cycling. So sustainability is basically, it's like a management plan on how do we come up with a strategy to use the earth in a way that we won't destroy it. We don't run out of resources. We don't have to go to other planets to do this like we're doing now to find resources. And also it looks at a way on how future generations can have uh, equivalent lifestyles to ours or even greener lifestyles 
in, so that we can keep using resources for generation after generation and not leave ourselves with basically the earth as a desert. So an important principle is sustainability. And why do they show a building with sustainability? It's because this is, you know, what we sometimes call a, a, a Leeds building, okay? And it has uh, been redesigned to be energy efficient and things like this. So um, there's all different strategies for looking at sustainability. But the one important principle of sustainability is we act locally, but also think globally and how our local efforts affect global use of resources for other people. So that means when we use petrol, most of our petrol comes from outside the United States. How is our petrol use affecting the people from the countries we buy it from? And we're gonna learn that as we go along. So we really have to practice sustainability at what we call a planetary scale. And sometimes we have to look at it from a solar system scale as far as resources that come from outer space. Cause uh, you'll learn in one module, but a lot of our water, almost all of our water came from outer space on tiny little rocks that help to form the earth. And we have to pay attention to that. Uh, radiation from the sun is very important for maintaining our sustainability. So sustainability is a very important effort. You have to create plans, goals, usually on five year to 10 year and 20 year principles. And we have to look at how our actions affect everything scientists tell us on how the earth and nature works. And we also have to look at also making sustainability palatable to our lifestyles. Because I can't just come in and make everybody live in tents in this country. I also don't want to uh, discourage other countries from achieving wealth and security very much like what we have here. So we do have to pay attention to with sustainability, addressing the issues of every society and even individuals and businesses and incomes and all sorts of stuff. And how do we make this earth that is usable to us, but also we don't exploit it too much to the point of depleting it and damaging it and leaving future generations with nothing. Another project that I truly enjoy working on is with the Ecological Society of America and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I um, basically teach scientists how to promote what's called the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or STGs. And we'll learn more about these in this class. And there'll be a mention of this in almost every lecture. The uh, United Nations has for long promoted a responsible use of the earth by everybody and is looking at cooperation between uh, developed countries or economically advantaged countries and poor countries. Because we find out right now that, you know, about 20% of the world, uh, world's population uses about 80% of the resources. And we take a lot of these resources from very populated countries that the people can't afford to purchase their own resources or use them because their countries are selling them. So we're hoping to do eventually in the future is come up with an, uh, an amenable way or, or a balanced way of using our resources. My emphasis is working mostly with water resources. So I teach people how to use water in responsible ways and how not to produce so much waste or very toxic waste or hazardous waste and also encourage people to reuse water in various ways to reduce its usage. Um, and that includes things like, you know, uh, cleaning up sanitation, using dirty water for agriculture, finding all sorts of creative ways of collecting water rather than all us being in competition for the same water supply. I'm also interested in how we obtain food from water. And uh, one of the biggest industries that, you know, when we talk about water has to do with fishing industries. And fish is one of the most consumed foods in the world. Now, maybe not so much in the United States, but it's very common in many countries. And we are running out of fish. We've actually had several species of fish that we eat go extinct. And even in the Gulf of Mexico, we're losing a lot of our fishing, our, our commercial fish. And it's sad to think that countries like Japan have to send fishing boats that go, go all the way down to almost the southern tip of Argentina and able to find fish. And this is becoming problems with other countries competing with each other for fish. So um, these goals are gonna be very important. And these goals are going to be based on the principles of, of basically um, environment, economy, and equity. And we mean equity within a country and between countries. So keep this in mind as we go through the class. When we cover every chapter, where does that chapter fit in 
to the idea of how we use the earth and how your personal or our nation's per capita footprint affects everybody else. And even if we don't care about other countries, how do we affect people within our country disproportionately? Because not everybody in our country benefits from resource use and gets at equal access to resource. Plus, we don't always suffer from the consequences of pollution. There's what we call a, dis a disproportionate suffering of the impacts of pollution. And people that don't have access to resources, unfortunately, are polluted most by the use of those resources. Now, another term you get sick of hearing about in this class is to be called resilience or resiliency or ecological resilience. What we do at resiliency is we look at a, a healthy ecosystem, whether it's natural or human made, because I mean, guys, these buildings we can build for resilience. I mean, Houston, we can build for resilience, whether it's a, a building, um, a, a, a dike like shown here, or a yard, or, or a forest. But resiliency means how do, we, how do we bounce back from ecological damage, from overuse, or from natural disasters like, you know, we had with Hurricane Harvey here or other hurricanes? How do we recover from earthquakes? How do we recover from atmospheric events? So when we look at the idea of resiliency, what we have to pay attention to is how do we maintain sustainability in an earth that is changing and an earth that does have natural disasters and also has lapses in policy. That means we have presidents or officials, governments that change and don't follow sustainable practices. They change laws so much that undo a lot of the practice that we did. And we go through these cycles in the United States over and over again, where certain presidents value the environment, others don't. And some value economics over ecology, other ecology over economics. And this is true for almost any country. So resiliency means do we bounce back and do all people bounce back to the point where they're, they've reached their current lifestyle and could live again without too much compromise. And sometimes resiliency takes compromise. It takes a lot of effort to do this. And this is the most difficult aspects of doing an environmental science. So about the first one third of this course is gonna look at the actual science of environmental science. Okay, but understand that environmental science is very interdisciplinary. Now, for example, my background in environmental science is heavy on, this, on the science, but I also have some background in policy and college courses in land use and in actually uh, agriculture. So when we look at environmental science, there's a pure science component to it, but also it works with other disciplines and sometimes other disciplines actually support environmental science. So I'd like you to take you to look at this little wheel over here and understand that besides science in environmental science, environmental science can support these other disciplines or these disciplines can support decision making for environmental science. So the science part of the class we're going to learn is one small part of the big picture of how we make policy. Most of environmental science, why we do it, is to make policies and regulations on how to live our lives either in a status quo way, where we just go about doing things that we want to do, or in a sustainable way, or any other way we want to. So we're going to be learning principles of chemistry, physics, which are other sciences, economics, because every time we make an environmental decision or do science, it's going to follow some type of cause to it. Um, we have to pay attention to sociology, psychology, all these other disciplines here. So be aware, particularly in a test, that these that it is a whole big picture of how we do things. We can look at technologies like agriculture, computing. And if you did not know, one of the biggest users of uh, resources as far as electrical resources in the world is the internet for all the energy that has to go into it and all the infrastructure it is increased electricity by an incredible amount and now when we see through remote learning and having you know this world that is basically everybody has three cell phones and you know several computers in a house it has become unimaginable that we we can't even keep up with electrification in many areas and we're still in finding ways to increase, you know, the digital world to other areas.
and give it access, which again means a lot of resources. So just think about all these different areas and think about the major you're going in and how that affects environmental science or is affected by environmental decisions, particularly if you're going into management of any area, you're going to be thinking about green economies or resource use. You have to think about things like pandemics, like the COVID that affects a workforce and COVID is an environmental issue. It really isn't. It has to do with how we live with animals and how we use animals and interact with them. Because a lot of most of our big diseases came from interactions with wildlife or agricultural animals. And if you're going into any type of industry, you got to think about the environmental impacts of it. So now we're going to discuss um, what is science. And you're going to see a short video about the scientific method and the whole idea of what is a variable. So science is a way of trying to figure out the world. How does the world work? And we believe that the world works in what we call a cause and effect uh, manner. And that just means that for everything we see, like why does this sun burn in the sky? Uh, why does the uh, earth you know, orbit the sun? Why do birds eat a certain type of food? These are all questions that we ask. Or why does a pollutant you know, produce a certain effect in the body? So scientific method allows us to find a analytical way of explaining nature that hopefully doesn't introduce bias or just, you know, a matter of fact explanations. And we use a process called the scientific method, which is not so much a series of steps, but a way that we think about measuring how nature works. So there's two ways of looking at science. We can look at what's called experimentation which is the whole foundation of scientific method. And again, you'll see a video on that that supplements this lecture. So please watch that. We also can look at what's called correlations. Now, this little figure here does not really look at correlations as much as what is the scientific method. So in the scientific method, what happens is a scientist comes along and wonders, you know, has a question of based on an observation that they see. And one example I can think about is um, one I was working on with what's called the Houston Galveston Area Council about some cattle getting sick from drinking out of the um, Bravo River. And what we did know about that situation is that the cattle started getting sick at a time of a big, after a big rain event. And we think that rain event actually flooded a chemical company and the chemicals from that chemical company leaked out through the sewage and into the, that river because that's all we knew at the time. So um, one way we can think about this is we can say, wow, there's a pollutant in the water that we know about that time and the cattle that are drinking out of the water, those are called free range cattle, they're getting sick. So we come up with an idea to how to test that using what we call the actual experimental method, I would have to design a way to show that that pollutant and only that pollutant, which that pollutant is going to be called the independent variable, that, and, and don't worry about where that term comes from. It just means it's independent of the subject. It just happens. And sometimes the independent variable is controlled by the researcher, but really it's controlled by nature. In a lab, we control it to see if it's causing the effect that we think it's causing. So in the case of the cattle, I want you to think about how we could design an experiment to do that, a practical experiment. And it's not an easy thing to experiment on cows. Plus, we'd have to think about what else is in that water too that can be causing a problem to the cows. Because if they, the, we find out that the pollutants from the company is not doing it, we have to think of something else. So if I was to test the cows using an experimental method, I would look for the pollutant, test it in the water, see if it's in the cow's blood, and then take some cows in what we call a controlled experiment and split them into two groups. And one group of cows, I would find a way of introducing the pesticide, hopefully at the levels that are found in the nature or, in, or that would end up in their body, and then take another group of cows and leave them alone. And then I'd have to look for the dependent variable. That means the illness that we saw from the cows that we think were contaminated. If it was a different illness from what we saw in the lab, then that's a problem. Now, the initial investigation or our initial hypothesis 
was called a correlation. So correlations are ways that we understand how to sometimes set up an experiment or are just things we observe in nature. And a lot of environmental scientists run correlations. That means that they look at pollution and then investigate illness in the areas where there are pollution. Now they have no proof that the pollution is causing the illness, but they have what's called a correlation, meaning two things occur at once. Then from that correlation, they can design an experiment. So listen to the video. This is a very complex topic, but um, you'll have practice looking at scientific method in this class. Now scientists also build things called models. And just think about a model is that if you want to build a new type of car, let's say, you don't just build that car in the factory. You come up with what's called a concept model. That means you take clay and you mold it into that car and then you study that clay car for aerodynamics, for appearance, for other things, you know, like how would a passenger fit in there and stuff like that. And the same is true for a lot of things that we do. We come up with what are called concepts. But in science, a model can be an object that we create. It could be a mathematical representation, a formula, or just an idea of how nature works. And we build models as a general way to try to understand nature in a tangible fashion. And don't worry about the picture here so much, but one and very important model we find for our area are models for hurricanes. How do hurricanes come to our area? How do they form? And we have predictive models that say whether a hurricane is going to pass us or not. Now, there's always going to be errors in models because models have lots of independent variables that go into them. The scary thing about doing science, particularly environmental science, is what we try to do in science is look at the relationship between one independent variable and one dependent variable. That means one cause and one effect. And unfortunately, when you start looking at things like, you know, meteorology or like um, how organisms exist in nature, there are many variables that affect them. And many creatures actually make decisions that in that itself is an independent variable. So this is a very complex topic, but, and this is why environmental science sometimes runs into problems because we have to work with what we call the best fit model and the results of our experiments. And sometimes we have to work with hypotheses. That means correlations that we notice that have not yet been shown to be uh, true or false. And we don't really say true. We say supported. We never really say true. We just say supported until more data happens. And this is one thing that frustrates the public a lot uh, um, is that we scientists appear to sometimes change their minds about things and no, that's not true. We're just gathering more data that shows that a particular independent variable may not be the major explanation for something. And this is actually what we discovered in the cattle situation. The cattle were not getting sick from the pollution. They were actually getting sick from uh, a washout from an old uranium mine that at that same time from that flooding storm washed uranium into water. And we weren't even looking for it until later on a geologist at Texas A&M discovered the radiation there by, sh by sheer accident and traced that radiation all the way down almost to the Corpus Christi area. And it was causing contamination of crops and illness and animals and people probably that drank out of that water. Now, science itself is difficult enough to do without having the challenges of public misunderstanding of science. And sometimes people are just fraudulent and calling what they are doing is science. And we find this all the time in environmental science, particularly people trying to sell you devices that clean the air in your house, clean the water, do whatever. You've got to be careful. So when we look at this concept of what's called fraud. There are people that just give you fake explanations that they say are based on science. Again, we find this a lot with um, these home remedies and other types of medications and, and, and things like that. So sometimes there's fraud and unfortunately some scientists are fraudulent, but usually they get caught and we, and unless it's a criminal effect, they don't go to jail, but they can lose their ability to get grant, fund, uh, grant funding to, to um, do their research or they can get fired from their institution because they're a liability. There's another type of um, 
non-science called pseudoscience. And these are claims that misrepresent science. And they could look at correlations and use these correlations as if they're cause and effect, except there's no evidence for it and no one really did an experiment on it to show that. Or a series of experiments, we don't just do one experiment, we do multiple experiments over time and variations of that experiment to show the truth. So fraud is just outright deceit. Pseudoscience may be ignorance to how the scientific process works. Now something scientists don't like talking about, because it is a weakness on how we do things, is that scientists are humans. And we come from diverse backgrounds, we have different motivations why we became scientists, and we get heavily invested in our research and in our hypothesis making. So humans are prone to bias and sometimes misinformation uh, um, on how we interpret data. So uh, we know that female scientists, particularly environmental science, have different ways of looking at interactions between humans, that, I mean organisms that males do. Females tend to look more at cooperation within living systems versus men tend to look at it as more competition. And this does significantly affect how we measure and understand nature. Uh, misinformation sometimes could be due to just incorrect data analysis, incorrect data. I mean, you know, we're collecting the wrong data and maybe our data is flawed due to instrumentation. Um, statistics can sometimes provide misinformation if we're not using the correct statistics. Uh, and, and this is, you know, a very difficult thing to do. We're going to try to do a little statistics in this class and you will find it rather frustrating. But it's just something we all need to experience. So bias, it still exists today. And a lot of our bias comes from information that we thought was true. And now other studies are showing that uh, those cause and effects are not necessarily true anymore to the levels that we thought they were. But some people hold on to these. And, call, and we call that also a bias. So how does science check itself? Whenever a scientific research study is done, usually what, what a researcher does is they repeat their studies and other people hopefully repeat their studies too. So we get a bunch of data to see if all the data and conclusions come out right. Because the conclusion is how we interpret our cause and effect relationship. So there's a, a, a concept called peer review. And that just means before a study becomes published, and this is not true for all situations, many online, uh, what we call journals, publish studies that are not uh, set for peer review. So what happens with peer review, when I do a research study or write a technical book, which I have completed, you know, one big technical book, working on another, I've written all sorts of other books, other scientists in that discipline look at the information and they review it to see if my data is good, if I'm interpreting it the way I should, if I'm putting in bias, and you know, and they also look at their interpretations of the, of the data to see if it matches mine. And sometimes their bias too, but what we do is try to come up with a consensus. So usually the paper goes out to maybe three reviewers and the, the editor of that journal or website comes up with what's called a consensus analysis. And we find out that the peer review system is a pretty good checks and balance. The other system that works for us is the fact that your paper becomes cited. That means other researchers are looking at your work and using it as the basis of their studies. And if they try to repeat your study or use your study as the basis of their hypotheses and they find out their research is not working, they can kind of critique your study and that study can be reviewed by them and they can find out if there's a flaw in your study or they can send it out to colleagues. So there are systems for catching us. If we have caught most of the fraud or misinformation or just the um, incompetence that goes into many types of studies. So one big area of where um, environmental science and how we investigate nature, investigate how humans do things. I mean, there's all sorts of things we do in environmental science. Um, we can research the, even the economics of doing something in a cost benefit model, which we'll learn about a little later. Um, one favorite area of mine is um, ecological footprints of individuals and societies 
and nations and even regions of the world, because this is based on a lot of how we uh, perceive nature, what's called an ecological footprint. So your ecological footprint is a way that we understand how many resources we are using per person or per unit of you know, our planet. We can look at this as a society, as individuals, whatever we want to do. But the ecological footprint could also look at how we're polluting and if we're using at a rate that is non-sustainable. So this is a very important complex measure that we can actually use science, many types of scientific studies to resolve and then plug that into economic systems and forecast systems that tell us, hey man, when we look at um, the ecological footprint of China, theirs is getting pretty big, you know, compared to other nations. And we can look at the United States who has, um, for our size, we have one of the larger ones. Okay, of looking at our ecological footprint. So you can take a very large country that has people that have a moderate ecological footprint and does that does have impacts on the world. But we could also take a very small population country, which the United States really is, compared to uh, India and China. And we have a large per person ecological footprint that that you know has some major impacts. And then we look at Australia, small population a rather moderate um, per person use of resources or per person use, I mean, production of pollution. So we're gonna keep, I'm gonna keep coming back to ecological footprint because this is part of the major measure of looking at sustainability, particularly global and cooperative global sustainability. So in this class, we're gonna look at how science is used to understand some of the major issues in the world. And these are issues that are adopted by, you know, like the United Nations and are worked into the sustainable development goals. So we're gonna look at population and growth rates of animals, plants, and humans and of ecosystems. We're gonna look at food and agricultural impacts. We're gonna look at energy types and trade-offs because we use energy in many ways, energy in the form of the amount of food that we eat, to the transportation, to how we build buildings and build cities and do trade. We're going to look at consumption and waste, cons uh, particularly consumerism. How many objects does a person have? Do those objects require electricity or other resources? What's the life cycle of those products? Do we throw them out? Do they end up in the environment? Are they made of toxic materials? Because science can answer all of this. And also the whole idea of urbanization. We've moved from a world that was almost all rural that will eventually be 90% urban by about 2100. And that's not that far off. And I definitely won't be alive for that. But, um, and that's gonna be incredible to think about. Imagine having almost all the world, like being like Houston or Beijing or these other giant cities. Just think about that. Think about the environmental footprint and the impacts. And we have environmental scientists in various areas measuring that. So another part of environmental science is the whole idea of human behavior. The thing about when environmental scientists use their information to make policy, that policy has to fit into human ethical, moral, and what we call materialistic uh, um, ideology or principles. And what's very important to understand is that ethics, morals, and materialism are very distinct things. Some, uh, most books tend to confuse these two right here, ethics and morals. So ethics we're gonna see are general social laws that we set that are based on consensus in a population or in a region. It's mostly what we sometimes look at as we call common sense ways of living, ways that we respect ourselves and respect nature. Morals tend to be based more on religious tenets and this is how I categorize it. So um, morals can work together with ethics or can stand apart. And a lot of people have an ethical system that overlaps with a moral system. And sometimes the moral systems conflict. Like um, in certain fundamental Christianity, um, the people do not accept evolution, do not accept some medical practices, which in the realm of science are important ethical things that we use to understand our science and apply them in ways for the common good.
Now, materialism is a way of thinking that means we have scientific ways of explaining things. And we can say that science can't solve a problem without putting into it ethics or morals. And this is a difficult thing to grasp, but just imagine working on a car. You have certain what we call materialistic or technical things you do to a car. You don't sit down worrying about the morality of fixing your car or the ethics of fixing your car. Should I fix my car? Should I do, you know, is it going to hurt the car? Is it going to, you know, do this or that? So think of scientists as being the people that come in and they look at the earth as a machine, what we call mechanistically, like a mechanism or like its material. And we reduce it to its fundamental parts. That's called reductionism. And we use that philosophy to make decisions. Then we make policy. And it's when we make policy is where the public, politicians, city planners, all sorts of people come in and tweak the, you know, the science with ethical and moral applications. Now, two important terms, and I'll hold you to two, which are very important, is the whole idea between right and wrong and good or bad. Because I ran into this once in Alaska when I was up doing a workshop for a friend in um, Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I got involved in a wolf situation with Senator, uh, uh, I mean, Governor Palin at the time in Alaska. This was many years ago. And Governor Palin was interested in increasing the moose population and the elk population of Alaska because food, their, their food sources were becoming scarce because of deforestation due to uh, harvesting of trees for paper and pulp. Uh, and um, so her science people told her, well, we can't really increase forests. We can't put out feed for these animals. It's too expensive. And that the tourism money for moose hunters and elk hunters is not going to really pay off to do that. So an easier way to be to reduce the predators and a major predator up in Alaska for elk and moose were wolves and wolves are native to up there. They're not like they were introduced. So they're native animals that belong there. And the wolves are not endangered in Alaska. There's pretty good mount to them. So uh, Senator Palin implemented a wolf eradication program to keep the population of wolves down to have a healthy population of moose and elk that serve the hunting industry. And you can calculate this mathematically. I mean, and we'll learn how this is actually done when we look at concepts are called biomass and food cycles and, 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 and energy pyramids, what we call feeding pyramids or trophic pyramids. Now, here was my dilemma. I, for a friend, he thought that killing the wolves was a bad idea. He did not think it was a good idea. And he was actually ethically opposed to killing the wolves. Now, there were Native Americans up there a lot, well, I should say, there's different, there's several groups of Native Americans, including the Eskimos up there, but many of the Native American groups were also opposed to killing the wolves, particularly because the wolves are sacred, they're nature, and they're not there to be manipulated by people, and particularly because it looked ugly that the wolves were being hunted from planes and helicopters by sharpshooters, which is actually scientifically the best way to do it, because it's quick, it's targeted, and, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it's better than trapping or other things. My problem was I had to live in a scientific world of right or wrong. So I could say that the way Palin's program worked, it was the right way to do things scientifically. The math was there to get the right population. To, when you do kill off predators, it does increase prey population pretty quickly. And, um, it would work. Now, to say it was wrong, I would have to have a scientific reason to say that. Now, if the wolves were endangered, I would say, yeah, that would deplenish the wolf population to the point where they might not be able to survive and go extinct. And you would have overpopulation of prey animals at a point where you'd have no forest left. So ethics is very important, or ideologies are very important when we look at how science fits into decision-making and into our own ethical and moral reasoning. Now comes the fun part.
So when we look at ideological systems or ethical systems, and it also fits into moral systems too, you have layers of way to, of how you use ideological systems. And these, and these ideological systems can vary based on situation. And I've noticed this with people too. So when we look at the more global, the largest categories that you can put yourself into are categories of how you perceive your relationship to nature and your relationship to other people. So we're gonna have two terms here, one called utilitarianism, one called the categorical imperative. Utilitarianism was started by, I shouldn't say started by, but it was promoted by a fellow named John Stuart Mill, and sometimes we call it as Millsian philosophy. Categorical imperative was um, pro promulgated by a fellow named Immanuel Kant, and his was more based on human to human interactions and very specific uh, um, situations, and it kind of got generalized into a global principle that we, that we sometimes uh, um, go anti-deontological. Don't worry about that. So utilitarianism, the best way to look at that is we look at what is the overall right? How do we determine a right for a society? And the best way to summarize utilitarianism is the needs of the whole or a situation or the earth outweigh the needs of a particular individual. So this is what we try to do in environmental policy, the problem with utilitarianism is we try to come to a common good. And the problem with a common good, that means almost nobody gets what they want, but we learn to tolerate certain situations to make everybody happy. And for the most part, many of our laws are utilitarian. And when I think about one utilitarian law that we have, it's the smoking laws. At one time, smoking was just, you did it everywhere. It didn't matter. And then we understood that it's a major pollutant and can cause health effects and other environmental effects, particularly when people throw cigarettes, you know, on the ground, even in the trash and in landfills, they can create a toxic problem. And, and we know that we have evidence of that. So what we do as a society, we say, my gosh, we got to protect the earth and other people from people who feel they have an individual right to smoke. So we set laws. And we set laws that people can't smoke in under certain situations. They really shouldn't be throwing their cigarette butts out. They can be fined for it if they're not thrown out properly. And we set all these restrictions and even get to the point of, of setting insurance policies that discourage smoking and say, you're not going to be insured if you smoke. That's taking away an individual right. But it's also protecting society. And sometimes we try to use utilitarianism to protect a person from themselves. And now, categorical imperative says that people have unconditional obligations to, to, to come up with these situations that try to protect individual rights. Now, this gets a little complex because I'm getting, because there, there's a little sloppiness in the categorical imperative. But the best way to think of the categorical imperative is that this is a, possibly a, a, a philosophy that supports individual rights. And you have to be very careful when you set rights and circumstances that you have to protect individual rights at all times, even when you're making utilitarian decisions. So yes, we, do, we don't say you can't smoke at all. We allow smokers to have rights, but it's gonna be restrictive rights and let them determine their own morality. So categorical imperative, it's almost like, it, it, you know, we as individuals have an obligation to live our own morality, but we also do have to pay attention to how our morality affects society in general. Now, if you found this confusing, it can be. And, and a lot of times these things are interpreted in, in very loose or very, and sometimes too what restrictive manners. But these are two global philosophies on how we use the earth. Because you could be utilitarian with people, you can be or categorical with people, you can be utilitarian, utilitarian or categorical with how you perceive nature. So now we're looking at if you're a categorical person or a utilitarian person, you now have another layer of yourself and where you believe you fit into nature and how you perceive you use nature. So there are three very important terms I'm gonna use throughout the semester. One term called anthropocentrism 
as in shown in the picture here. Anthropocentric people are people that believe that the earth is there for them to use. And this could be an ethical principle or a moral principle. Uh, you find this moral principle sometimes defined in various religions, where how do we use the earth? And some cultures believe that the earth was given to them, to, to people to use solely without consequence, while other uh, religions believe that the earth is for us to maintain, manage, and just borrow. And everything you take out, you put back in the way you got it. So anthropocentrism is basically a way that people own the earth and we're in charge of it and we don't give other creatures value as far as saying that this earth is there too. Now there are extreme anthropocentrics and mild anthropocentrics, but extreme anthropocentrics tend to be those that just believe that nature is their dominion and sometimes they even treat other people this way too. Then the opposite of that is biocentrists. Biocentrists look like they look just like anthropocentrists. You can't tell them apart. Biocentrists almost believe that humans do not fit into nature. There's actually one group of biocentrists that believe humans are aliens that were seeded accidentally on the earth and now we're screwing it up. Um, so when we look at biocentrists, they put nature first. And you find a lot of extreme environmentalists tend to be biocentrist. They respect nature either equally to humans or sometimes above humans. And I have people that, uh, that I work with that are severely biocentrist to the point where you can't work with them because they don't want to set policies that also help anthropocentrists. They sometimes tend to be very categorical and say nature or rules should protect nature and that is it and humans have to be willing to work categorically within those guidelines, no flexibility. Do you see what a categorical comes in now and utilitarian? Then the other one is ecocentrism. These tend to be moderate people. And you're gonna see this in a case study called um, um, uh, Oh Deer. It's about a deer population that has to be controlled. And you're gonna see groups of people, we have to read the last page of the assignment to see these people but and, and respond to them. But um, you're going to have to recognize who is anthropocentric, who is biocentric, who is ecocentric of the people that are speaking in that scenario. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, these are all another way of thinking. And this works its way into policy. And that's why when we make policy, we basically make sure that people of all these different ideologies are sitting in that room. And sometimes governments can be anthropocentric societies could be anthropocentric or biocentric. This is the beauty of these philosophical approaches to environmental ethics. Now there's another layer, and this kind of runs parallel to the biocentric anthropocentric level. So now we have what are called environmental attitudes. That means in the culture you grew up with, what was the approach to that society? So there is something called a development or developmental approach. These are typically nations or societies that try to build human-centered societies, which is slightly anthropocentric, but not totally. But it just means we believe in machinery, development, complex buildings, cell phones, you name it. This is an approach that people use technology. And we sometimes use the term anthropogenic meaning that human developed nature. So developmental people tend to like cities. They tend to thrive on technology. They tend to use a lot of resources and believe the resources are there for usage. And they sometimes even believe in going beyond the boundaries of their resources. This then gets into what's called developmental uh, uh, colonialism. Guys, when we look at the United States and how the, the poor Native Americans had to deal with the developmental colonialists, coming from uh, um, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, England, and the Africans had to deal with the same thing too, with all these uh, European countries coming in, wanting to develop their home countries using African and American and even Indian resources, whether it was food or whatever. And then we tried to make these people somewhat developmental too, so they could be manufacturing centers for us. 
preservation approach is just the opposite. And you usually find a lot of biocentric people gravitate here. Preservation approach uh, is a very restrictive approach and we don't try to do it totally, you can't. But it means humans have to leave the earth the way they are, it is or put it back exactly the way we used it. And we know we can't do this in a sustainable manner, but we do set aside places called preserves, like a wildlife preserve. There's one right near, not too far from um, uh, um, South Texas, not too far from us, uh, um, where literally there is a fence around this park and it is illegal for you to go into it. It protects the native wildlife in an area totally surrounded by um, refineries. It's right near Freeport. Uh, we went to visit it uh, two years ago and we could not get in, but we did were able to look in and see this wilderness we didn't know existed in that area because the, 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 the officials that lived out there made a decision to protect it. And then there's a conservation approach. And, the, and this is a midway between development and preservation. It means, man, we got to find a way to do things sustainably. That means use researchers, have human or anthropogenic needs and desires, but also maintain our resources so we can maintain this development approach. So just think about this. And you will also see these and be able to recognize these in the people in the deer case study too. You'll be able to tell who's a conservationist, preservationist, developmental type person. Now we're coming out to the home stretch. And this gets crazy now. So now these become other areas of philosophical thought that we apply as individuals or as scientists, and again, or as groups. So we have a big field called ecofeminism. And this is actually split into two groups. Those that believe we treat earth uh, like it's a, a nurturing mother, mother nature or Gaia is their fundamental concept. That means you don't harm your mother, the, the, the earth that is feeding us with resources. And the other aspect of ecofeminism is um, this uh, is protecting women because women's bodies tend to be more sensitive to the environmental pollutants and decay and resource usage. And this is not being sexist, this is being realistic. And, and, and not all women are ever gonna have children, but women that do, the, feet they carry, the women carry the fetus. And the fetus is uh, anywhere from 10 to 1,000 times more sensitive to in environmental decay or factors that affect the mom. So and that's, so that's another aspect of environmental feminism. There's something called social ecology. This has to do with how societies perceive the value of nature. And this is often applied in how we develop parks and how we perceive green space and recreation. This is used a lot in developing recreation. Then there's something called deep ecology, which I don't deal with too much. It's almost all philosophy and not so much science. But it looks at the true value of nature. What, how is nature really supposed to do its job? And then where do people fit into this? And this is a very heavy philosophical and also mathematical statistical type of thing. Very difficult to read books unless you've been in philosophy a long time. Then there's something called environmental pragmatism. These tend to people tend to be conservationists. They tend to be middle of the road people. And um, it just means how do we use the environment in practical ways, depending on what's going on. That means if you don't have a particular resource, find something else to use. If your current resource usage is getting out of control, find a way to do it better. Be practical or pragmatic. One area that um, I have difficult dealing with when I make policies of environmental aesthetics, that means nature has its own built-in beauty. Like a squirrel has beauty. I have a little squirrel right here, if you can see him in the picture. Okay, so there he goes, my little squirrel right there. Hi! So as an environmental aestheticist, I can say squirrels have their own beauty, their own value in nature, and I should leave them alone and not harm them. And maybe I should even help them it, cause, because our environment is taking away their food. Maybe I should feed them. Maybe not by hands, but, you know, by putting out corn for them. So environmental aestheticists you find in a lot of uh, um, groups like Greenpeace, 
sometimes, because they sometimes look at the aesthetic value of nature besides other perspectives. Artists could be environmental aestheticists. And then there's the animal rights and welfare. Animal rights tend to be biocentric, that animals have equal rights to nature and resources as humans do. And then animal welfare tend to be more middle of the road and could also be anthropogenic and say, well, you know, we are using animals and maybe we should provide them with comfort or give them at least something back for what we're doing to them. A lot of alpha, uh, animal rights groups that are involved in animal welfare do um, they do a lot of conservation work, let's say preserving horses in nature in the West or rescuing animals and stuff like that. So be aware of these groups. And, and these might not be, be so evident in the people you're going to read about in your case study. We're now coming to the end of this lecture. Yay, it's been about an hour. So when we look at the science, we look at the ethics, and the whole idea of how people now view how we're going to apply our environmental science is going to be in a developmental way, this way, that way, blah, 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 um, is that we have to pay attention to this whole growing idea of global sustainability. I mean, the United States is kind of on the borderline of, of adapting sustainability, and sometimes we accept it fully, sometimes we reject it. Right now we're in an objective phase, and another couple of years will be in an acceptance phase, and we go through cycles. But overall, we are recognizing that sustainability is the proper way we should direct our science and our environmental ethics and environmental ideology thinking. So, and, and sustainability is set up in charters. We can't mandate it, but eventually we can set laws and regulations like the United Nations is doing. So, the ethics fits in. I'm not, I don't want you to worry too much about this slide, but the United Nations is now assigning rights. And sometimes these rights are based on legal decisions, based on moral decisions, based on ethical decisions, is that people, or in certain cases, animals, have a right to adequate resources. And not only adequate, but clean resources. I work with the right to safe drinking water and also the right to proper sanitation. Because if you just throw your wastewater out, it can become a horrible problem. At one time in this world, in developing countries, one in three people, children, die before the age of three from contaminated wastewater in their environments. And in some areas are still at one in five to one in seven. You don't find that. If that was happening in the United States, we would have a revolution. I mean, we'd have an overthrow of the Environmental Protection Agency to do something about it. And then we have this, what's called a deontological ethics. And that means we, we, we build this duty-bound definition to take this kind of, you know, um, utilitarian approach that we all have to work together in this. And you're going to hear eventually a video on this from a fellow named Hans Rosling later on in the semester. And this is probably the most difficult thing to do considering how people just don't get along and there tends to be, particularly in the moral, the moral realm, sometimes incongruities between sustainability and moral decision making. And, and the problem with when we look at nature too, we have to assume that nature has a value in itself and is not just a tool. We have to give it respect. And this is a principle of sustainability that is very difficult for people to understand because anthropocentrists tend to see no intrinsic value to nature except that it has a purpose to themselves. We call that, you know, utilitarian. That sounds kind of funny, but utilitarian, a little different utilitarian, but whatever. Whereas other people feel, man, I'm, I, you know, I'm harming nature when I'm using it, so I better respect it in the way I use it and preserve it, conserve it. So to summarize all of this, just keep in mind is that our central focus is to look at interrelationships. Interrelationships between the different disciplines that we mentioned earlier, how our environmental ethics 
our reasoning, how science work together and impact, you know, economics, po politics, all these other things we saw in the little circle of disciplines. Uh, we have to pay attention that we're going to be focusing on sustainability, also a little resilience. OK, mostly sustainability. And we have to look at sustainability from the perspective that we live in a world that tends to be fundamentally anthropocentric, you know, in its leanings. And particularly the countries that call all the shots tend to be um, very developmental and also colonial. And so we have to look at how particularly they are leading the way. That means countries like the United States in setting the norms for consumerism and how we do things. So and, and when we when I think of one of the biggest factors that we have to deal with this is energy use, because anything we do in nature, no matter what, any environmental decision is going to involve some type of energy related use. And ultimately, we have to get ourselves to believe that there is an ethical obligation to do things. I mean, utilitarianism and categorical imperativism both say there are ethical obligations out there. It's just going in different directions. But we have to be able to develop this. And we do have to respect individual rights and needs, as well as what is best for society. Because sometimes we have to give up needs. Now, guys, there's a difference between a need and a want. A need is something that you have to have to survive or else you undergo stress and you can't develop as a human or a society. A want is something that you would just like to have and don't really need it. So we got to be very careful when we start um, looking at ethical ob obligations because to say you have to give up a need or a right can be dangerous because it can kill you. It can harm you, but to give up a want is probably not going to kill you. And we have to pay attention to is that even though a country might not be capitalistic, they might be a supplier to capitalistic countries and have to pay attention to that model of operating and have it, you know, work with their own political systems. And this and capitalism does have a major impact on the environment and tends to sometimes put the environment second for the ability to have a functioning economy. So on that note, we are done with this lecture.